again, YouTube. If you haven't seen my videos before, I'm Ross, also known as the Oliver Man. And before we do anything today, I first want to say thank you because we've got over 200 subscribers now to this channel. I'm glad you're enjoying the Oliver and White theme videos, and I hope to keep making more as long as everybody wants to see them. Well, for today's topic, I thought we would talk about some of the electrical system components on the Oliver tractors, specifically the alternators. And for that, we're going to go over to a different tractor. If you follow me on Facebook, you might recall that I got this tractor back in May, I believe it was. I can put some pictures in of how it looked when I first brought it home. It had a cab on it, and I took that off in one of the other videos. And our problem with it today is that it is not keeping the batteries charged, which is really a sad story because I put two brand new batteries in it probably in about June, and it's got to the point now where they won't start the tractor. So uh, I thought it would be a good time to talk about charging systems, and we're going to swap out the uh, alternator and regulator on this tractor, and hopefully it'll be charging the battery correctly. And... Uh, I don't have to jump it every time I need to use it. Well, if you've ever been around Oliver tractors, this is the setup that was used on all of the tractors that uh, started with alternators when they switched over from generators in the uh, late three-digit series. My 770 with the flat top fenders has the uh, factory alternator on it as well. And this is just a Delco system. It's got a alternator like you would have found on a GM car from the late uh, 60s into the 70s with an external regulator. And I think when people look at these, they're kind of intimidated by, you know, having two separate pieces, but really there's not that much to them. I mean, you have a wire that goes from your alternator over to your regulator, and then you have your battery wire on the back of the alternator that runs, uh, you know, to do the charging for your battery. And then all your voltage regulator does is tell the alternator when to come on and off. Basically, on your regulator, you have the wire that comes from the alternator that goes over to your field terminal on the regulator. And then you have a wire that is hooked to the key and tells it when to turn on and start charging. Some of these regulators actually use a third wire in here that is uh, hot all the time. And I've encountered that before. And what I usually do is I just make a jumper wire from here to here, and then that'll fix that problem. So you'll have to just see which uh, type of regulator you end up with, but either way it'll work. I like to put this setup back on the tractors just because that's the way they were made. I know a lot of guys swap out to the some of the different style alternators, which I'll show you here in a minute, but I like to keep things somewhat original. Uh, if it came from the factory with an alternator, put it back like it was. They have a nice bracket they made that bolts to the block to hold the regulator, so I just, I, I've been doing it that way. I don't know. There's no right or wrong way. It's your tractor. Do whatever you want, but... I like to put them back the way they're supposed to be if they had an alternator from the factory. The next variation of three wire alternators is this, which is known as a 10SI. And basically what the difference is, is the, it has an internal regulator. So you don't have to have an external regulator on here. And uh, I use these whenever there's space on tractors that didn't originally come with an alternator, like a Super. This is a Super 77. And you don't have to worry about uh, clearance here with your side panels. And I'll show you some examples of things I've done on mine later when we talk about how to convert them over to alternators. But anyway, this is a 10SI three wire. You have your battery wire that your charging goes to. And then you need to have one wire up here that is hot all the time. And then one wire that is comes on with the key to signal it when to charge. So 
what I do again is I just jumper this wire over here instead of running another separate wire back to uh, get to the battery power. So this is a simple setup and I like it because it charges right away uh, when you turn the key on. This is what is known as a one wire alternator. It's identical to the uh, 10SI that we just saw in the other tractor, except you see there's no place for a plug here. They've got it capped off. It uses an internal regulator with a self-exciter. So what happens is you rev the engine up to a certain RPM and it kicks in and tells this thing to start charging. Now this is great if you want a simple uh, hookup because you only have to have the one battery wire. But what I don't like about it is there are certain situations where uh, if you aren't paying attention and don't rev it up first, uh, the alternator won't be charging and then all day you're running this or whatever, it's just running the thing dead, you know. If you were running something like a hay elevator and you just had the tractor about half throttle or less, it may not be enough to tell the thing to start charging and then all day long where you're using it, it's sitting there just drawing current off the battery but not uh, doing any charging. So that's my big reason why I don't like to use these. I tried a few on a few of my tractors that I converted over but I ended up where I just started putting the other one on that had the three wires so that as soon as you turn the key on, it would start charging and you didn't have to worry about that. Now, a lot of people like to convert their older tractors that had generators to an alternator. And I do the same thing whenever I can just because they just are so much uh, more reliable, it seems like, and you, it, less maintenance. And there are several tricks I've learned along the way about what will fit and where, and uh, I guess we'll just start with this one. This is a 60, and there is actually enough room that you can get a uh, either the three-wire or the one-wire self-exciter. You can get it up into the tractor and still get the curtain closed. You can see how I've bolted it to the block with a... Uh, on this one it worked out you didn't need a spacer there and I got a short short belt and actually I just realized that I don't even have the <laughs> I don't have the uh, bracket hooked up for the tension it's just I measured it right where it's tight against the block I guess and it's uh, you know the belt fits on there and runs around the water pump and everything and uh, it fits in there I don't know if we can get a profile of it, but you see it's not past the uh, where the side curtain sits. So in this case, this size of uh, alternator worked great in here. And later on, you'll get to see something that I found that I think I would probably use again in something like this. So you had a little bit more adjustment, but I'll show you that after a while. Now, this is my 77 that you've seen before in videos. And about a year or two ago, I went a different route on this one because I got tired of having to bend the curtain to clear the alternator that I had in there. I didn't like it. And I even tried for a while going back to the generator and I didn't like that either. It just seemed like it needed a lot of attention. So I'll show you what I found on this one. This is some type of a mini Chinesium alternator that I got off of the electronic bay. And I really like this thing. It fits right in there and you have room to spare between it and the side. I don't know if I can show you without the sun shining on it or not, but you've got plenty of room to close the curtain without worrying about it. I could never get a full-size alternator to fit in here that suited me. It always seemed like at the angle it was at, it wanted to make you have to kind of bend the curtain around it, and then your front latch wouldn't always hold, and it would pop loose at the bottom. And I tried extending that a little bit, and I didn't like the look of that. So I saw these on the internet, and I thought, I'm going to try one. And so I looked around, and I actually found one that is like a... Essentially, it's a two wire. It just uses your battery wire and then it uses a wire to tell it when to charge 
and that's all it takes and i am really happy with this the downfall is it was kind of expensive i think it was over a hundred dollars but as far as fitting in here it works great the charge is great and you can see i uh, had to make a spacer for the bottom because it doesn't have that wide uh, area in the casting like the other alternators do and then at the top i just i had to make a spacer to go in the adjustment bracket but this is actually the factory adjustment bracket that was on the generator so really very very little modification to put this in uh, other than again i got the shortest belt i could physically get in there and i don't know if we can see the number on it or not it's kind of faded we'll look after a while when we edit and see if i can make sense of that and i'll put the number across the bottom but it was a trick getting that on i mean you couldn't have got a bigger a uh, shorter belt on unless you took the fan off this was the shortest belt i could get on there with the fan still on and there is a little room well not much i mean it's pretty well up against there so you have some adjustment room to move it out and like i said there is plenty room uh, on the side here to you still have room where you can adjust it out and get the curtain closed so overall i'm happy with that it is expensive so i use the other ones whenever i can but i would definitely do this again because it was simple and it looks good when you're done you don't have to worry about the sheet metal being all goofy because you're trying to uh, curve it over a too big of an alternator here's a 70 and as you can see <laughs> it's got a full-size alternator on it and you can see what i'm talking about about having to kind of bow the curtains out and then the hinge doesn't stay closed so sometime i'm going to get another one of those mini alternators for this because i really don't like having to do that i could probably get a shorter belt and get this closed a little bit up in there because there is room but uh I think the simplest thing is just those mini alternators. I'm, I'm a fan of it. There is room with the way this block is. You can curve this up in there and get the panel closed, but you don't really have much adjustment before you have to start, uh, you know, worrying about bending the panel like uh, you saw a minute ago. This tractor hasn't run in a year or so. It. Uh, Needs some work done to it. I think it's got a blown head gasket now because it seems like it was bubbling up through the radiator. So every time I walk by, I usually give it a turn around or so of the crank just to make sure everything is the way it should be. So anyway, that should hold it for another few months until I ever get time to work on it again. Well, this is an 88, as you can see, and you have plenty room to put whatever you want in this one. There's quite a bit of clearance because the frame is wider, and so you can put a full-size alternator on there and still have plenty room. So, again, like I've said, I use these uh, three-wire 10SI alternators just because as soon as you turn the key on they're charging and in some cases like on the fleet lines you may have to put in one of these and that is a diode and basically it's like a one-way valve for electricity because uh, of the way that it's wired up on the combination switch it's possible for the alternator to send power backwards and it won't shut the tractor off when you shut the switch off. It just runs the distributor from the alternator power. So uh, you put that diode in and it stops that problem and then it works correctly. If you put one of these on a tractor that has a switch that has an accessory position, then you can put your signal wire uh, that tells the alternator when to charge on the accessory terminal and then leave your ignition wire from your distributor on the ignition terminal and when you shut the key off it should work without the diode but you'll just have to play with it and see uh, what you come up with but 
anything can be done so don't be discouraged but on an 88 you have plenty of room to get the curtain shut and that's how i did mine here's a super 66 and again what i said earlier on super series tractors you can put whatever you want on there because you don't have to worry about the uh, side curtain over top of the alternator so i like i've said in all the other ones i use the uh 10si with the internal regulator and i'm happy with those most all of the older olivers use this same type of starter uh, they interchange on pretty well all of the gas models and i mean it's a very simple setup it's got one cable to it coming from the push button and when you push the button on the dash really what you're doing is you're just connecting uh, two terminals with a piece of metal inside the switch and then it sends the current from the battery straight to the starter and that's what turns it over to start there are a few exceptions to this starter and one of those is the early diesels and i'll show you one of those right now this is a diesel starter on this one's on a super 77 but it was the same way on the fleet lines that had the diesel and you can see physically this is bigger in size it's also got a different number of teeth on the gear so you can't interchange but the biggest difference uh is that it has the push button right on the starter and what you do is you use this rod i've talked about that in different videos but you kick this rod forward and that's how you start the tractor when you, when you push that rod then it pushes this button which starts the starter motor spinning but you're also through your linkage on your rod you're shoving the bendix gear into the flywheel which makes it engage the flywheel and turn the motor you see they had to have a much bigger starter to turn over a diesel and oliver was the only real true start diesel of uh, most any of the tractors i think some of the cockshuts had it too but basically a lot of your other companies like uh the other green on their diesels they used a four-cylinder gas motor on top to start the diesel motor because it had so much compression the red guys they used a setup where on one side of the motor you had the complete gas fuel system and you started the motor on gas and then you pulled a lever and it switched it over to diesel because it was too hard to turn over a diesel with the batteries they had at the time they didn't have as good a stuff as we did but oliver used two six volt batteries uh, connected in series to make 12 volts and then they used this big starter and they started directly on diesel and a lot of the accounts that i've heard was that the oliver diesel started in cold weather better than a lot of the other gas tractors so this is a pretty good design they had going and it lasted up until uh, the time of the uh, improved supers where they went to key start later on with the four digit tractors they went to this style and it's basically the same bottom part of the starter other than they added a solenoid mounted to the top because now you had key switches and you didn't need to use the push button anymore so in this case you run your battery cable right to your solenoid Here's your power feed wire for your dash, and then there's a wire from the key to send it uh, the signal to turn over and start. Some of the earlier solenoids had another wire that sent your power to your distributor, but I always change it over to this, and I run a wire from the key switch to the distributor. I find that it makes them start better. Uh, sometimes in the others, there was a little bit of lag in the... Uh, like you'd crank on it and it would start when you'd let off of the key so this is just the way i've been doing it i'm not saying your yours is right or wrong but this is the setup that i've been using this starter is on our original 1650 that we've had for years it was probably about maybe a year old or so when grandpa bought it but uh i'd hate to say how many hours are on this 
it's probably well over 10,000 because the uh, tachometer quit working. It never did work in my lifetime until I hooked it up again. And that was maybe three or four years ago. And you can see it's got 7,000 hours on the tack. So for about 25 to 30 years, it was not counting. So I would say it's safe to say it's well over 10,000. When you get to four digit diesels, they went to a starter that looked like this. And for the most part, they're all very similar. Although I've heard there are some differences in RPMs between a few of the models, but basically it's a bigger round starter and uses a top mounted solenoid. And again, you just run your battery cable to it. And then you have your power out wire to your dash and you have your signal wire from your key to tell it to start and uh, this is what they used but i have found a better solution you may have seen these on the internet for sale this is a gear reduction starter and i had seen them for a long time and i thought i always wanted to try one well i am definitely a believer now they spin so much faster and it just makes the tractor start easier so anytime i need to replace one i just buy this and i've been very happy with it you can get them from uh, a place called maple springs farms they sell them i've seen them on ebay and i'm sure there's other places you can get them too but i've bought i don't know probably half a dozen of these and I have only good things to say about them. I've been very happy. As a matter of fact, on the 1755, this was the only way I could get it started. I had the pump rebuilt, and I could not get it to run. Uh, it just wouldn't, with the factory starter, it would smoke a little bit, but it would not run. I tried to pull it, but the tractor had been sitting so long that it lost its prime in the hydraulic shift, and so it was just uh, kind of spinning inside itself. It wasn't letting the motor engage to turn. So I took the starter off of this 1855. I had put one of these on it and I put it over on that 1755 and it fired right up. So I ordered a new one and put back on the 1855 and I've got one, like I said, I've probably got, I don't know, I've put on at least three or four around here and then a few for other people and I am really satisfied with them. This tractor, my 1855 has been sitting for probably three or four weeks and we'll try it right now and see how well it starts it might make a liar out of me but this starter really does a great job So if you own one, you should be able to tell the difference between how much faster that spins versus a, uh, a factory starter. And it really spins faster than that if you're using it all the time. I'd say the batteries are probably a little weak from just sitting here. But anyway, that is well worth the money. If you're thinking about it, I highly recommend it. So honestly, I think what's going on on this 1755 is that this regulator is probably sticking and it's causing the battery to drain uh, if you forget to unhook the battery like I do. I've said in videos before, I, I like to unhook all my battery cables when I'm done. But uh, I think since the tractor sat so long that that's probably what's at fault. But if I'm gonna put a new regulator on it, I think I'm going to just swap it out and put a different alternator on it that I know is good. And then I don't hopefully, in theory, have to worry about this problem for a good long time again.
Okay, a couple things to note. There is a spacer in there, so don't lose that when you take that out. And another thing to note is that the original, as you can see, has a double groove pulley. And a lot of your replacements that you'll come across if you end up buying a new one or whatever have a single groove pulley. So we have to switch that now. And it's really not that difficult, so we'll go do that. Simplest way to do this is with an impact. And just find your socket that fits. And I'll have to put you down to do it because it really takes two hands. Hold it with one hand and take the pulley loose with the other hand. One thing you may look for is sometimes it takes spacers and things that might be underneath the pulley. This pulley has a uh, little flange made into it, so it doesn't need that. There was this on top under the nut, so we'll see how it works out, whether we have to use this or lock washer putting it on the new one. And it's just that easy. Now we're ready to put it back on. Okay, we got that mounted in there. This uh, guard can be kind of troublesome. There's not, uh, you very seldom see them on the tractor because it's frustrating when you take this off to reach that bottom bolt. But I put it back on. So we hook up the battery wire, <clears throat> put the boot back over top of this. And it should be made in such a way that it holds the boot on there. Probably would help if I got a newer boot. This one's kind of dry, but there it goes. Plug your plug back in. If your plug's bad, you can get replacement ones off of the internet. So uh, I like to do things right. You can just take a spade terminal and shove it in there, but I like the plastic piece that's supposed to hold it. Now for the regulator, if you look at the new regulator, you can see that 
the holes don't just bolt directly to the bracket. There's actually like a rubber isolator that it sits on for vibration. And so the originals are riveted to that bracket. And since the replacement did not come with it, you have to drill out these rivets and then I just bolt them to it. So we'll work on that now. If you look at the underneath of these two regulators, the original and the re replacement one, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. The other one used just one uh, signal wire and then what it's done is it's got a metal plate made to jump it to this terminal. So you didn't need a hot all the time wire. So I will more than likely have to make a jumper wire to get over to that so that it uh, does work correctly, but that's no big deal. Okay, so here we are, it's the next day. Last night it started getting so dark that it was getting really hard to see on the camera what was going on. And the later it got, it seemed like things started not going right. So I figured we'd just stop and pick it up here today. So I got the alternator on and I did end up taking that uh, guard bracket back off. I didn't like the way it fit. So I took it back off and the alternator is on and now we're to the point where we need to mount the regulator on here and the camera did not record the footage of drilling out those rivets because if you remember the old uh, voltage regulator was mounted with rivets to this isolator bracket to try to cut down on vibration so i got those drilled out and now we'll mount the new regulator and i just use quarter inch bolts to mount it up on there and then uh, the other thing we have to do in the wiring is the original, as I showed in that other video clip, used like a jumper on the back of the regulator to uh, connect these two terminals when you turn the key on. And since this new uh, regulator here, it does not have that jumper made into it on the two terminals, we've got to put on a jumper wire to make it work correctly. And that's not a big deal, but... I'll get you uh, set down again and we'll get that mounted up and then we'll try it out and see if it's charging. Okay, so to fix this uh, problem here with needing the jumper wire, we'll get the terminal out of the plastic housing and then I'll try to crimp an end on it and just make a little jumper loop to go over to the next terminal. So if you can see how these are made in these plastic housings, they just have a little uh, piece that sticks up off of the terminal and that locks them in the plastic so you can use it as a single plug with multiple terminals. So I've got some more of these type ends and we will just redo it and then uh, make our jumper with one too and we should be in business. I've talked about these terminal ends before and uh, it's another GM product and you can get it at Napa, a box full of them. And I like them because they just, it makes it look like it's factory and it's not, you know, a bunch of homemade crimp ends. So anyway, Look them up if you're interested.
So there we have it. We've got our jumper in place and we've got the plug back up in where it belongs. So now we'll try to start it and make sure that it's charging correctly. All right, here's the moment of truth. We're gonna start it up and see what we get. Oops, got the fuel stop out. Here we go. And right away it's charging. Back it off and it drops a little bit. It's charging a lot right now because those batteries are way low, so. That's a lot more than it was doing, so I think we're in good shape. Well, there we have it, brand new setup. charging good and it uh, has not been squealing the belt so I think we did a good thing and it's starting to go down uh, on the amount of charging the longer it runs so it should be in good shape some of you are probably wondering why I didn't just take this and get it rebuilt well I usually keep several of each style alternator on hand and then i just rotate them in and out as i need them i've got a place that rebuilds them for me and they do it cheaper than i can even get the parts so i usually wait till i've got two or three things to take down there and then uh, take it down there have them check it over and then i keep it on the shelf for a spare so anyway i don't throw anything away so this will be rebuilt and saved for later on sometime whenever I uh, end up needing one on something else. So that's the story with that. So again, I want to thank everybody who has subscribed. We've got over 200 subscribers and getting more every day. And again, if you aren't subscribed and you like these videos, please click the thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. And I'm going to keep making videos that have Oliver and White tractors as long as people are interested in watching. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.